time. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry Thank about you. that. Thank you very much, Adrian. So uh, just before I introduce Sarah, who I think we should give another five minutes to, okay? Um, <laughs> Um, I want to uh, mention that there is a special issue of the Infant Mental Health Journal uh, that has articles by many of the contributors uh, who are here, and that um, this is free online uh, at the Infant Mental Health Journal website. This is, uh, was edited by Hi Fitzgerald and me, uh, and uh, Sarah Jaffe, for example, has an article in here related to what she's going to talk about today. So uh, you may want to get that. And it's only free for till the end of this year. In January 2020, you have to pay. <laughs> so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sarah Jaffe, who had a very hard time getting here yesterday, and we appreciate that she's stuck with it. Uh, she is a developmental psychologist who <clears throat> conducts research on at-risk families and children. She completed her PhD at the University of Wisconsin and then did a postdoctoral work uh, in social, genetic, and developmental psychiatry uh, at the, the center in, at King's College, London. She is currently a professor and director of graduate studies in the Department of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania and a faculty director at the Field Center for Children's Policy, Practice, and Research. So please welcome Dr. Sarah Jaffe. Thanks so much, Paul, for that lovely introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here after a somewhat arduous journey. Um, although I have to say that when I, when I looked at the program, I was originally scheduled to speak yesterday, and I, and I realized that I was scheduled to speak right before lunch, and I thought, oh no, I'm, I'm gonna be standing between, between everybody and their lunch, and, and that is not an enviable position. But, but I'm now thinking that I would rather be standing between you and your lunch, even if you had missed your breakfast, rather than having to follow Adrian, uh, because I, I do not have the capacity or the imagination for hyperbole that, that Adrian has. Um, so I'll do my best uh, to keep you entertained for the next 45 minutes or so. All right, um, we're talking about why it is that males engage in more violent behavior than females do, and, and these are some data from the 2017 FBI Uniform Crime Reporting Survey showing that men who are represented by the green in these bars comprise the majority of those who are arrested for violent crimes, including um, arson, including manslaughter and murder, um, and a number of others. And these are data from the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System Survey, which is a nationally representative survey um, in the United States that covers six categories of health-related behaviors that contribute to disability and death, including unintentional injuries and homicide. And what you can see in this figure is that boys, um, ninth to 12th graders, are more likely than girls to engage in most of these. Um, behaviors, most of these violent behaviors, with the exception of physical dating violence. And um, boys of color are particularly at risk for these. Um, so for example, African American boys are even more likely than white boys um, to have been threatened with or injured by a weapon on school property. So. The fact that there are these sex differences in violence and that, that boys are engaging in particularly high levels of violence obviously matters for the victims of, of violent behavior, but it, but it matters for, for men um, because violence is involved with at least two and arguably three 
of the leading causes of death among 10 to 24 year olds, including homicide and unintentional injury, and, and I would argue even suicide. And again, um, boys of color are, are particularly affected by this. So for example, the rate of fatal gun deaths is five times higher for African American males between the ages of 15 and 24 um, than it is for white males. So the question that we're trying to answer in this conference is why it is that males engage in more violent behavior than females do. And there, there are at least two explanations for this. And one is that boys just have more risk factors for violence than, than girls do. And here in this figure, I've, I've listed some, some, some individual and some peer factors that are associated with antisocial behavior in a longitudinal study that I'll talk about a little bit later. And what you find in that study is that boys um, just have more of these risk factors than girls do. They're more at risk for ADHD in early childhood. They um, are subject to higher levels and more frequent harsh discipline than girls are. They have more reading problems. Their peers engage in more delinquent behavior in adolescence. So it may be that the reason boys are engaging in more violence compared to girls is just because they have a higher loading of risk for violence compared to girls. The other possibility is not that boys have a higher loading of risk for violence, but that they're more susceptible to those factors when those factors are present. So here are some more factors um, that are associated with violence. And in the same longitudinal study that I was describing a minute ago, it, it turns out that, that girls and boys don't differ. Um, in the prevalence of these, in these risk factors. So girls are just as likely to be, as boys to be rejected by their peers. They make just as many residential transitions as boys do. Um, they have the same rates of low IQ. But in the sample, these factors are predictive of boys later antisocial outcomes, and they're not predictive of girls later antisocial outcomes. So it may just be that, that um, boys are more susceptible to these risk factors for violence um, than girls are. So what I'm gonna try and do um, in the rest of this talk is, is answer a series of questions um, that, that try and get at this issue of why it is that boys engage in more violence than girls. And I'm gonna do it with a couple of illustrations, one having to do with exposure to lead in early childhood and the other having to do with exposure to maltreatment in early childhood. And the first is to identify risk factors from early in the life course, because that's what we're interested in, that are predictive of violence in adolescence or adulthood. The second is to think about the evidence that these are in fact causal risk factors. And I just wanna pause for a moment and, and reflect on what I mean by that, because at face value, that might sound a little absurd. Like who doesn't think that maltreatment is a cause of violence? But the reality is that risk factors like exposure to lead and even maltreatment are correlated with a lot of other things that are also risk factors for violence. And in the kind of observational, correlational research that we do with humans, right, we're not, we're not randomly assigning people to be exposed to lead or not exposed to lead, and we're not randomly assigning people to be physically abused or not physically abused. It actually becomes surprisingly difficult to determine what's a cause of violence and what's just associated with violence because it happens to be correlated with things that are the true causes of violence. And so you need sort of clever research designs to be able to, to identify what the true causes are. And this matters because a lot of people in this room are interested in intervention, right? And our interventions are targeted. We do interventions to prevent maltreatment. We do interventions to reduce levels of lead in our atmosphere or in our drinking water. And if those things aren't the actual causes of violence, then our investments in these interventions are not, are not going to be very worthwhile, right? Because we're not going to be reducing the outcomes that we're hoping to reduce. All right, so we want to review the evidence that these are, in fact, causal risk factors for violence. We want to think about whether these risk factors are, are more common in males than they are in females, whether they're just more prevalent for, for boys than for girls. And we also want to think about whether these risk factors are more strongly associated with violence for boys than they are for girls. So that's gonna be the goal of the, the next two parts of this talk. All right, so I'm gonna start with lead exposure. Why are we worried about lead? Well, we're worried about lead for um, 
the fact that exposure to lead in early childhood produces um, lesions that are widely distributed throughout the brain that affect signaling, signaling and microstructure. And the blood-brain barrier is, is ineffective against exposure to lead during the prenatal period. And so it's, it's thought that these um, effects of lead exposure on the brain are what explain the cognitive deficits and the behavioral deficits that are typically, that are typically associated in children with exposure um, to lead early in life. And we think that these cognitive deficits and these behavioral deficits are what underlie the violence um, that we see later in life in adolescence and in young adulthood among individuals who are exposed to lead earlier in the life course. Now there's not um, a, a one to one correspondence between exposure to lead early in life and violence later in life. And it may be that there are interventions that we can introduce early in the life course that deflect individuals from that pathway. So for example, there are animal data that show that when, um, that when rats are exposed to lead um, early in life, if they're raised in cognitively enriched environments, that that reverses the cognitive deficits that are associated with the lead exposure. And although there aren't great data from humans um, that would speak to that question, it certainly seems like a plausible, um, plausible hypothesis. And similarly, it may be the case that there are behavioral interventions, that there are parenting interventions we can do, for example, um, where we promote supportive parenting that might, that might reverse some of the behavioral deficits that we see associated with exposure to lead early in life. In the past, before the 1980s, children were primarily exposed to lead um, through gasoline fuel exhaust and through lead-based paint. But in the 1970s, um, there was legislation that um, mandated the elimination of, of lead-based paint. Um, and the passage of the Clean Air Act um, mandated that lead, um, lead additives to fuel had to be eliminated, had to be reduced by the mid-1980s. And so now, the way that children are primarily exposed to, et, to, to lead is through um, household dust, through contaminated soil, through, um, through their diet. So for example, in drinking water, if lead is leaching out of rusted lead pipes, for example, um, through air pollution, and through um, lead paint that might flake off into, into paint chips. And even though lead levels um, have dropped dramatically since the mid-1980s in children, um, there are still at least half a million children in the US who have what the CDC defines as elevated blood lead levels, which is five micrograms per deciliter. And this is, this is salient to us um, currently, um, given the, the Flint water crisis, for example. So these are some data from Flint, Michigan. Um, so when Flint changed its water supply, um, the levels of lead in drinking water inadvertently increased dramatically. And, and so what you can see in this, in this figure are lead levels from, um, from Flint overall, um, which is what that second set of bars on the left are, on the right, um, and then in areas where there were very high levels of lead in the drinking water, and, and then the last set of bars are where there were lower levels of lead in the drinking water. And the blue bars show um, the percentage of children who had elevated blood lead levels, so that five micrograms per deciliter threshold, um, children under the age of five who had um, elevated blood lead levels before the city changed its water supply. And then the red bars are the percentage of children who had elevated blood lead levels after the city changed its water supply. And what you can see is that blood levels jumped dramatically, particularly in the areas of the city where the water supply was, was particularly contaminated by lead. So we can ask whether exposure to lead in early childhood is likely to be a cause of violence. Um, and, and we worry about this question because exposure to lead is correlated with a lot of things that might also be causes of violence, right? Lead exposure is not randomly distributed throughout the population. 
people are exposed to lead in areas where there are high levels of poverty, um, both at the individual level and at the neighborhood level, where there are high levels of violence in neighborhoods. Right? It's correlated with a lot of other things that might be causes of violence. And so what's, what's the unique effect of lead? And there are a couple of different designs um, that have been used to try and answer that question. So these are some data um, from um, Jessica Reyes, who's an economist at Amherst College. And she capitalized on the fact that the passage of the Clean Air Act kind of provides a natural experiment to ask how much reductions in lead in the population led to reductions in crime. And so her observation was that kids who were born in the early 70s, who then became young adults in the early 1990s, were probably exposed to very high levels of lead, you know, in the atmosphere, for example. Um, but the kids who were born 10 years later in the early 80s and who became young adults in the late 90s and early 2000s were exposed to much lower levels of lead because the, the Clean Air Act was successful. Um, levels of lead dropped dramatically um, as, as lead additives were removed from gasoline. And so her question is, are there, were there actually reductions of cr in crime in that decade as the population of young adults shifted from those who at the beginning of the decade had been exposed to very high levels of lead in childhood to at the end of the decade, those who had been exposed to relatively low levels of lead in childhood, right? So is there a change in crime in this period? And what she found was that there was, there was a 56% reduction in crime over that decade um, when the population of young adults shifted from those who were high lead exposed to those who were low lead exposed. And, and moreover, states that showed the largest declines in leaded gasoline also showed the largest reductions in, in the crime rate. So, so these are some compelling data speaking to the importance of, of lead in, in crime. There are also data from prospective birth cohort studies that speak to this question. Um, so the Cincinnati lead study um, was a study of a birth co cohort that was recruited between 1979 and 1984. And women in the study were enrolled in their first trimester or early in their second trimester of pregnancy. And they were recruited from neighborhoods that had high concentrations of older homes that were likely to have flaking, flaking lead paint. Um, the sample included 376 infants, and, and they were seen um, between the ages of, um, between the time they were born and five years, they were seen um, quarterly. And then from five years to six and a half years, they were seen every, um, every six months. And at every one of those time points, they provided blood samples and, and blood lead levels were measured. When the sample um, reached young adulthood, when they were 19 to 24 years old, a group of criminologists at the University of Cincinnati um, got information about their criminal records and looked at the question of whether their exposure to lead in early childhood was related to their criminal, um, their arrest for, for violent offenses in young adulthood. And they found that it, that, that it was, right? So, so what you see here, if you focus on the solid line in the middle there, um, what you see is that for every five microgram per deciliter increase in lead exposure, there was a 30 to 48% increase in risk for being arrested for a violent crime. And, and this study controlled for lots of things that you would think would be associated with exposure to lead. It controlled for poverty, it controlled for mother's education, it controlled for mother's IQ, it controlled for all kinds of things that might also be related to young adult violent offending. All right, so we can ask the question of whether um, boys are exposed to more lead than girls are. And, and the answer to that question, maybe surprisingly, I guess I was surprised, was, is yes, they are. So, so these are data from the National Health Nutrition and Examination Survey, which, which is another nationally representative survey in the United States. Um, and, and these are data that span um, the time from 1999 to 2014. And you can see two things in, in this figure, um, which is representing the percentage of children under the age of five um, with elevated blood lead levels. Um, so for one thing, what you can see is that there's been a, a consistent decline in blood lead levels over that period from 1999 to 2014. 
But what you can also see is that boys consistently are more likely than girls to have elevated blood lead levels in, in early childhood. And so the question is why? Why would that be? Why would boys under the age of five consistently have elevated blood lead levels compared to girls? And one possible explanation has to do with very early emerging sex differences in activity levels. So before 12 months, boys are significantly more active than girls, right? This is the period of time when infants start crawling, and, and boys are just moving around a lot more than girls are. And as I was reflecting on this, I, I came across this picture. This picture in the middle is my younger daughter, who turned 10 a couple days ago. But when she was a baby, we had chickens. And you would think from looking at this picture that we lived on a farm in the countryside, but in fact, we lived in South London. And the chickens would free range in this little yard that we had behind our house, and Rachel would free range in this little yard that we had behind our house. And I would just try to not think too hard about what Rachel was putting in her mouth as she was roaming around the garden, and the chickens were roaming around the garden, pooping all over the place. And, you know, I think it's a similar story with um, boys and lead. As boys are crawling around and they're doing that more than girls are, there's household dust that's going in their mouths, there's paint chip that's going in their mouths, there's contaminated soil that's going in their mouths. And this may be one of the explanations for elevated blood lead levels in, in boys compared to girls. I will say that child has a very healthy immune system these days, so I'm, I'm going to feel okay about that. All right, so, so um, boys do seem to get a bigger dose of exposure to lead than girls do in early childhood. We can also ask whether boys are more susceptible to lead when they are exposed to it than, than girls are. And the answer to that question is maybe, but probably not. Um, there's, there's not a huge amount of data on this question. There's been a meta-analysis that looks at the relationship between exposure to lead and a whole range of neurodevelopmental outcomes, none of which are violence per se, some of which are antisocial behavior in childhood. And most of the time, exposure to lead, um, most of the time, even though exposure to lead is associated with antisocial behavior in childhood, it is not any more associated with boys' antisocial behavior than it is with girls' antisocial behavior. There is some evidence that um, exposure to lead may be more strongly associated with neurodevelopmental outcomes more broadly for boys than it is for girls, um, but, but it's not um, the overwhelming majority of these studies um, that show that pattern. So I would say the jury is out on whether um, lead exposure is more strongly associated with boys' neurodevelopmental outcomes generally than it is with girls' neurodevelopmental outcomes. All right, so just to summarize um, what I've been talking about in the first part of this talk, lead is likely to be a cause of violence. Um, boys seem to just, I would argue, ingest more lead early in the life course than girls, and they wind up with a higher dose of exposure to lead. Um, but not a whole lot is known about pathways from lead exposure to violence, although they're likely to involve deficits in executive function and in emotion regulation. And these things are likely to be exacerbated by the cycles of poverty or the context of poverty and limited resources in which um, children are being exposed to lead. All right, so I'm going to move on to the second example of child maltreatment. Um, child maltreatment is another one of these exposures that's particularly prevalent in very early childhood. So these are, these are national record data showing the um, rates of exposure to abuse and neglect among children at various ages. And what you can see is that the highest rates of exposure to abuse and neglect occur in children under the age of one. Um, and then they, they drop off after that point. So this is a, a problem that's particularly um, pervasive in early childhood. And there's a fair bit of epidemiological data to show that abuse and neglect in early childhood are related to later antisocial behavior and later violence. Um, so this is just an example. This is a paper that my colleagues and I published a while ago now showing the relationship between exposure to physical maltreatment in early childhood and kids' antisocial behavior when they're five and seven years old. And what you can see in this figure is that um, the bars on the, on the left um, 
represent the association between maltreatment and antisocial behavior at age five. The ones on the right represent that association at age seven. And the kids who are, um, uh, that we were the most confident had been physically maltreated in early childhood had significantly higher levels of antisocial behavior at both five and seven compared to the ones who had not been physically maltreated before the age of five. These are data from um, Kathy Whittam's longitudinal study. Um, Kathy Whittam has a uh, she's a, a researcher at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and she has a long-standing, um, really amazing sort of case control design where she recruited a sample of kids um, who had court-substantiated records of abuse or neglect, um, and then she recruited a, a, a matched control sample, right, kids who did not have records of abuse or neglect but who were sociodemographically matched to her to our abuse neglect group. And, and again, that's important because abuse and neglect, it's another thing that doesn't occur at random in the population. It often happens in the context of, of poverty and lack of opportunity. And so she wanted to make sure that her control group was equally disadvantaged in those ways compared to her abuse and neglect group so that she could be more confident that whatever associations she saw between abuse and neglect and later outcomes were really due to the abuse and the neglect and not to all the things that are usually correlated with that. And so when she followed up these individuals as adults and she looked at their criminal records, um, this is what she saw. She saw that um, the abuser neglect group had a significantly higher risk for um, juvenile offenses. Um, these are violent offenses in, in this figure. Um, and and um, they had a higher risk, although not a significantly higher risk, for adult offenses. And, and when you when you combine their juvenile and adult offenses, you can see that the um, abuse and the neglect group um, uh, were about 35% more likely um, to have been arrested for violent offenses. So there's strong epidemiological evidence that maltreatment early in life is um, likely to be a cause of, of violent behavior later in life. Um, we can ask why that might be. Um, one person who's done a lot of work on this is Seth Pollack at the University of Wisconsin. He's been very interested in the possibility that youth who are exposed to um, abuse, and particularly physical abuse, um, become hypervigilant to threat. And, and in a series of very elegant studies that he's done, um, he's shown that physically abused youth are, they're more attentive to anger cues, they, are, um, they have difficulty disengaging their attention from anger cues. They're more likely to identify ambiguous cues where it's not clear what the intent of your partner is as being threatening. Um, and they recognize anger on the best basis of less perceptual information um, than youth who haven't been physically abused do. So just an example of that last point is provided here. This is the design of a study that, that he and one of his colleagues did back in the early 2000s. And what they did is they recruited a sample of boys who had physical abuse histories, and they um, also recruited boys who did not have physical abuse histories. And they presented them with these images of facial expressions Right? And some of the expressions were expressions of anger, some of them were expressions of sadness, some of them were expressions of happiness. And what you can see is that um, when, when these images um, first emerge, they're, they're completely degraded. You can't tell what the facial expression is at all. But, but over the course of the trials and the experiment, they gradually resolve until you can tell, oh, that's an anger expression or that's a happiness expression. And the instructions to the participants in the study were to correctly identify the facial expression on every one of those trials. And so the data are down there on the left. And the top line are the data from the physically abused boys. And the bottom line is the data from the control boys, the ones who don't have physical abuse histories. And what's on the y-axis is the percent of boys on every one of those trials who are correctly identifying that expression as an anger expression. So you can see, if you look you know, at trial one and trial two and trial three, who knows what expression that is? Right? And consistent with that, you can see that a very small proportion of either the physically abused boys or the control boys were correctly saying, that's an anger expression. But as they go along, by the seventh trial or the eighth trial, and you can see up there, like, it's still not that easy to tell what expression's being 
being posed. But the physically abused boys suddenly pulled ahead, right? A significantly higher proportion of them, relative to the control boys, were beginning to correctly identify that as an anger expression. And it wasn't until nearly the end of the trial, when it's quite clear what the expression is, that the control kids caught up in terms of their accuracy in identifying those facial expressions, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a fair bit of evidence that youth who've been um, physically abused, at least, um, are just very sensitive to expressions of anger, and there's good reason for that, right? Like, that's a very salient signal to kids who've been physically abused. It means something bad is gonna happen. And being able to recognize that facial expression, paying attention to it, is very important for survival, right? So, so these data make sense. But, but if you have this hypervigilance to anger, and, and, and you're seeing anger in, in situations where maybe anger's not present, you may be responding with aggression in situations where it's not necessarily appropriate to respond with aggression. All right. It's also not the case that everybody who's exposed to maltreatment is, is equally at risk for maltreatment. Or, sorry, <laughs> everybody who's exposed to maltreatment is equally at risk for antisocial behavior, right? So these are data showing that the effect of maltreatment depends on a person's genetic background. Um, and again, these are some data that my colleagues and I published a while ago um, showing that the effect of maltreatment depends on, on a child's genetic background as estimated by their um, familial risk, essentially, for, for antisocial behavior. And what you can see from the solid line is that the effect of maltreatment is, is stronger um, uh, um, at, at high levels of genetic risk, right? Among the kids who have the highest genetic risk for conduct problems, that effect of maltreatment is essentially exacerbated. And there have been a lot of efforts in the last um, decade or so to identify specific gene variants that might um, explain who is more susceptible to maltreatment um, than, than anybody else. And, and one of those gene variants that's um, been studied extensively is, is one called the MAOA gene. Um, it uh, codes for the MAOA enzyme, which breaks down neurotransmitters that are involved in, in aggression and impulsivity. Um, and it comes in, in two versions. There's a high activity version, which is associated with high expression of that gene, and there's a low activity version that's associated with low expression of that gene. And, and the figure shows the first study um, that was able to demonstrate an interaction between um, carrying that version of the gene or, or, or variation in, in that gene um, and exposure to maltreatment. And so these are data from the Dunedin Longitudinal Study, which is a birth cohort study in New Zealand. And what you can see there is that for individuals who carried the low activity version of the gene, there was a robust effect of maltreatment, right? The kids who were maltreated in early childhood were at significantly greater risk for conduct disorder and, and in adulthood for um, more serious forms of antisocial behavior compared to the kids who are not maltreated. But among those who carried the high activity version of the gene, their risk for conduct disorder was low regardless of whether they'd been maltreated or not. Right? So the extent to which maltreatment is associated with risk for conduct problems or for later antisocial behavior depends on your genetic background. And the, the figure on the far left shows the results of a meta-analysis that came out about five years ago of many studies that have now looked at that MAOA gene. Um, and it shows that there's consistency in the findings, that across those studies, the, the values on the, on the left, the sort of smaller values, represent the fact that individuals who carry the low activity version of the gene are more susceptible to maltreatment than individuals who carry the high activity version of the gene. All right, so are boys more likely to be maltreated than girls? Um, they're not. Um, in fact, girls are more likely to be maltreated than boys, although the difference is very, very small, and the only reason that it's statistically significant is because some of these studies that look at this question have absolutely enormous samples. Um, so the, the, it, it doesn't seem to be a plausible explanation that maltreatment explains sex differences in, in violence because boys have a, a higher burden of maltreatment than girls do. We might also ask whether the association between maltreatment and later violence is stronger for boys than it is for girls. 
And it turns out that there is surprisingly little data on this question. Um, so to the extent that people have looked at this, the findings are very mixed. Um, there have been some studies that show that um, boys who are, that, that maltreatment is predictive of violence for boys, but not for girls. But there are just as many studies that show that maltreatment is predictive of violence for both boys and girls. And so the, the, the data that exists are very mixed on this question. Um, it's not helped by the fact that a lot of studies that focus on violence um, only include boys. And so it's impossible to tell whether they're more susceptible to violent, uh, more susceptible to maltreatment than, than girls are. Um, it doesn't help that many studies of maltreatment don't actually measure violence per se. Um, they measure broader forms of, of antisocial behavior. Um, and finally, a lot of studies that do measure maltreatment and violence don't actually test for sex differences in the effect of, um, in the effect of maltreatment. So to summarize this part, childhood maltreatment is likely to be a cause of violence, um, but boys are not more likely to be maltreated than girls. Um, and it's not really clear if child maltreatment is more predictive of boys' violence than it is of girls' violence. So to conclude, um, I, I, I want to describe um, a model for thinking about links between early exposures um, and sex differences in violence. And, and I want to be clear that none of what I'm suggesting is, is novel. Um, people have been talking about these processes for a long time, but I'll apply them to the specific example, say, of lead exposure um, and, and later violence. Um, so we know, for instance, that boys get a higher, a higher dose of, of lead exposure in early childhood compared to girls. And, and this may lead to relatively small but significant sex differences um, in temperamental traits like impulsivity or attention um, or persistence. And these small differences may become amplified over the course of development as children interact with caregivers and teachers and peers who may perceive these behaviors as disruptive, or as disrespectful, and who may respond to them in ways that promote more serious forms of aggression um, or disengagement from school. Um, and these cycles are likely to be exacerbated by poverty um, and lack of access to opportunities that may make violence and, and violence-related behavior um, seem like um, reasonable avenues um, for boys and for young men. And that framework implies that, that early intervention um, at the point when the cognitive and behavioral sequelae of these early life exposures first become apparent um, is, is important for deflecting boys from a trajectory that ultimately leads to violence. And, and, and we've been hearing yesterday from, from people who know a whole lot more about intervention than I do, like Danny, um, that these kinds of early interventions um, can be successful. Um, but it may suggest also that um, Boosters are needed at later points in development, um, at points when children are making key developmental transitions um, to school, for example, in order to provide them with support um, to maintain skills and competencies um, that they acquired early in development and, and that they may no longer be having the structure um, to maintain. All right, and so I want to stop there and I want to thank you for your attention. And I'll take questions. Yeah. Um, usually in studies where people say that they're measuring violence, they're, they're measuring it through official records. Um, so they're measuring it through um, criminal arrest records, um, sometimes through criminal conviction records. Occasionally it's self-reported violent behavior, um, but, but more often it's through arrest records, which I recognize have any number of biases. Uh, as do the authors of those studies. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a question that, that matches the first question. Mm -hmm. 
who is committing the maltreatment against the children under a year old? Are these the mothers or the fathers? Because if it's the mothers, then we do have violence among mothers. It's just not reported. It's in the home. Mm -hmm. So um, in the first year of life, right? so, so um, the most common form of maltreatment in the first year of life is neglect. Right, so most of the children under the age of one who are being reported to Child Protective Services are being reported for neglect. They're not necessarily being reported for, for physical abuse, al although a number of them are. Um, in some cases, that's the mother who's the perpetrator. In some cases, it's somebody else. It's a, it's a step-parent, it's the father, it's somebody else in the house who is, who is a perpetrator. It w it, is there another part to your question? Just well, you know, my question is, you say that the girls are as susceptible as far as violence. We just don't see it in official records. And I'm wondering if the, the girls show the violence in different ways. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, and that's, that has been a longstanding question, right? Whether um, the way that we measure violence, you know, through official records... Um, is just not recognizing the ways in which women engage in violence. Um, and um, that, I, I, there, that's a distinct possibility. Um, although, although there are data, certainly it's the case. I, I think even if you account for the fact that women may be manifesting violent behavior at home, <laughs> for instance, right, against children, um, it still is not going to bring up rates of women's violence to match those of, of men's violence. Um, there are also data that, that show that um, becoming a parent is actually a, a buffering, it's a protective factor for women who were engaging in violence. So women's violence declines when they become mothers, um, which is not necessarily true um, when men become fathers. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have another question on the maltreatment. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about um, the, you said that um, boys don't bear the burden of more maltreatment. It's actually 1% less than girls, 12% mm -hmm. to 13%. But in, in terms of what you know of uh, having broken the, those data down, do we know anything about what kinds of maltreatment boys are? Uh, so is it, you know, could it be that boys are exposed to much higher uh, violent, abusive kinds of maltreatment as opposed to girls which may be experiencing more neglectful mm -hmm. categories of maltreatment. Do you have any information about that? Yeah, there, there really aren't categories of maltreatment where boys are experiencing a lot more than, than girls are. Um, so I think um, the, the, the data show that boys and girls are showing roughly equal rates of maltreatment across different categories of maltreatment, and I think what's bumping up girls is the fact that they're more at risk for sexual abuse than, than boys are. Okay, one uh, issue around the infant uh, maltreatment and assault that uh, in the death data we know the uh, sex of the perpetrator. So when you have shaken baby and abusive head trauma in an infant, it's more likely to be by a male mm -hmm. than by the female. When you have in the hospitalization data, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have the information about the perpetrator. But again, shaken baby or abusive head trauma mm -hmm. are the highest prevalence of maltreatment uh, diagnoses that end up either in death or in the hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I have two questions. Okay. I'm over here. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> You're from echolocating. I'm used to being invisible. It's all right. Um, <laughs> I'm a mom. Okay, so um, <laughs> you mentioned that um, the greatest exposure, the greatest uh, problematic exposure for children with regard to lead is in the prenatal period, but none of the data uh, look at that. So I would love, because it would be obviously mom's ingestion or mom's, mm -hmm. so I would like if you've got some information on that. And the second question is, um, uh, why are you stating that lead is causally related to violence when we really can't say what those plaques are doing in the brain. I'm just curious about, that was a very strong statement, so mm -hmm, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so that Cincinnati lead study did actually look at um, lead exposure in the prenatal period, and that figure that I showed um, of the relationship between exposure to lead 
and um, later arrests for violent offenses. Um, one of the analyses in that study did break down by, by strictly prenatal exposure, right? So just looking at the levels of um, lead essentially at birth, right, which would, which would have reflect their prenatal exposure. Um, that, was, that was still significantly associated, um, even, even controlling for their later exposure, um, with uh, later violent arrests for violent offenses. So there are some studies that have looked at prenatal exposures and um, later outcomes, but, but it's, it's the minority of, of studies. Um, the, the reason I'm um, saying that um, lead is likely to be a cause of, of violence um, is largely because of the um, kind of quasi-experimental data that come from Jessica Reyes's um, study. So, so there, for example, it's like, it's like a universal intervention, right? The, the fact that um, lead, lead was reduced for everybody in the country, regardless it wasn't selectively reduced for some people and not reduced for other people. It was, it was effectively a universal intervention that reduced lead. And, and universally, you saw that there were reductions in crime over that decade as the population shifted from kids who were um, highly exposed to lead to those who had low levels of lead exposure. I'm not saying, to be clear, I'm not saying that lead is the only cause of violence, right? There were a whole lot of other things that were happening over that same period that were also contributing to reductions in crime. Um, and, um, but, but lead is likely to have been one of those causal factors. That, that's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, I just wondered about the slide about the the same slide about the maltreatment up to age 18, uh -huh. or by 18. I wondered if it was broken down by age when the maltreatment occurred, oh. because I was thinking of the Bucharest Early Intervention Project, mm -hmm. and we know um, from that research, we know that boys are very um, vulnerable to the lack of attachment-related uh, maternal responsivity and sensitivity, mm -hmm. and I think that may I don't know for sure, <laughs> I'm not doing the research myself, mm -hmm. um, that may be an explanation as to why there might be more association with violence later. Yeah, um, so those data, those data were not broken down. So you're talking about the sex differences data? Yeah, so that was just you know, cumulative risk up to age 18 for maltreatment, and so it's not broken down by the age when that happened. But, but it's a really important question, right? You know, like maltreatment is not maltreatment is not maltreatment. The effects may vary on when in the life course it happens, how long it goes on, um, what the severity of it was, and it is really, really hard to figure out which of those things may be the most important in predicting, in predicting outcomes in, later in life. Like, we just, you need really enormous, really well-characterized samples um, to adequately answer those questions, and, and not very many people have, have those data. But it's, it's a really excellent question. Sir? Yeah. It's Hi, Fitzgerald. Thanks. As you know, I'm from Michigan State University. I don't have a question, I have a comment. Okay. Um, every child in Flint, Michigan, now has uh, blood samples taken. That's amazing. And so uh, every child, mm -hmm. because many of them were exposed for up to two years before anybody changed the water supplies and uh, provided uh, filters and other kinds of things. So unfortunately, we will have enormous data mm -hmm. to uh, assess the impact way beyond just violence mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the impact of brain of lead exposure to brain because the lead exposure was, was excessive. Yeah. So, Thank you. Sarah, I had two questions related about the differential exposure to lead and the antisocial behavior outcome. Mm -hmm. One is, any possibility that males and females clear lead from the system at different rates, so mm -hmm. that even though the exposure is the same, mm -hmm. the uptake is different, or the maintenance in the system is different? There, so there are not good data on that in humans, as far as I know, although there are certainly data on um, the extent to which genetic factors, so, so there are gene variants that influence the extent that how, how efficiently you clear lead from the system. They're not in humans sort of um, uh, uh, 
distributed differentially for males and females, but yeah. Okay. yeah. But we do know there's variation in clearing. Yeah. So even if it's not genetically tied, that's a possibility. Right. The other is, if there's more variance in male violence than there is in female antisocial behavior, mm -hmm. couldn't that explain the differential association between the predictor and the outcome? Simply there's more opportunity for co-variation between exposure to lead and the outcome. So it's really not so much that girls are affected less, it's just our statistical strategies can't you know, adjust for that differential variation. Yeah, I think, I think that's a possibility. I mean, I think in a lot of these studies, it's just very, very difficult to figure out what, um, what reflects the reality of life and what reflects just statistical artifacts, right? What, why, you know, I think there are cases where we don't see um, differential effects because samples are just too small to be powered to detect them. Um, or we don't see differential effects because there's a lot of variation in the outcome for males, or, or we do see differential effects because there's a lot of variation in the outcome for males and there's not very much variation in the outcome, you know? So it's, it's again, it's really hard to design these studies in ways where you can, you can be confident that what you're seeing is, is real and, and, and not a statistical artifact. Yeah. <laughs> she is. Compared, compared to my older one, who did not free range around the garden and, you know, put poop in her mouth, like, uh, yeah, she's, she's remarkably free of allergies. So I have a question, Sarah. Um, you were involved with the Dunedin study in some mm -hmm. ways, and there's this really important distinction that was made between life course persistent and adolescent limited uh, antisocial behavior. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just wondering if you could, uh, since... Uh, you're up there, you were involved. If you could describe a little bit the, those two, the distinctions and really pretty striking uh, sex differences in how boys fell into the um, uh, life course persistent pattern. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the idea is that this notion that there might be two groups of people who are involved in antisocial behavior really came out of a lot of criminology research um, um, showing that there is an age crime curve, right? That, that criminal offending peaks in late adolescence, young adulthood, and, and then it declines. And, and the question that puzzled everybody for years was, you know, who, who, are, these, who are these people at the peak um, of, of this curve? And in the early 1990s, Timmy Moffat, who was my um, PhD and postdoc advisor, made the observation that maybe this peak comprised two distinct groups. Um, and that one of those groups were individuals who had started to engage in antisocial behavior very early in the life course, early in childhood. Um, and, and early in childhood, their parents and their teachers um, were recognizing that these kids were disruptive in school and that they were physically aggressive and that they were, they were destructive. And, and, and they, they carried on at those levels through childhood and into adolescence. And, and even in young adulthood, they were continuing to engage in high rates of, you know, adult kinds of antisocial behavior. And so she, she labeled that group a life course persistent group. And she hypothesized that, that those... Um, individuals, and, and, and when she sort of developed this theory, she was really thinking about boys' antisocial behavior, um, that, that they were individuals whose um, early emerging antisocial behavior and then their persistent antisocial behavior um, was really um, emerged from the confluence of two things. Um, one was a kind of neurobiological risk for antisocial behavior, um, and you could see that for in, in terms of their um, uh, sort of high rates of, um, so a number of sort of biological risk factors that they, that they had in early childhood. And, and then also a kind of a context of poverty and social disadvantage that essentially exacerbated those, those biological predispositions um, for disruptive and destructive and aggressive kinds of, of behaviors. Um, so that was one group. And then her observation was that in adolescence, that life course persistent group was joined by um, what she called an adolescent limited group, 
Um, so these were kids who, prior to adolescence, looked like your average kid in terms of their relationships with their parents, in terms of how they were doing in school, in terms of, um, in terms of their relationships with peers, but that in adolescence, they came up against what she labeled the biological maturity gap. Right? And this is the idea that, that you hit adolescence and um, suddenly puberty kicks in and you start to look like an adult and you start to sort of feel like an adult biologically, but socially you're still treated very much like a child. Right? You have a curfew, um, you have to take out the garbage on Monday nights, um, your teachers expect you to do homework every day. And her argument was that for some adolescents, this mismatch between their perceived biological maturity and their social maturity motivated them to engage in, um, to seek out antisocial peers and to engage in antisocial behavior, where antisocial behavior was sort of seen as a way of, of, of being able to act like an adult, right? That, that um, you know, uh, truanting from school, um, stealing things, like getting things that adults have, drinking underage, that these were sort of adult-like things that you could do. Um, and, and, and what she reasoned, what she, what she hypothesized, is that by, by young adulthood, for that, for that adolescent limited group, they would start to see that the costs of engaging in antisocial behavior um, were, were outweighing the benefits of engaging in antisocial behavior, and they would desist from, they would desist from their, their sort of delinquency. Um, so, so there were these two groups, and in subsequent research that has been done on the Deneen sample, that, those, that grouping taxonomy has essentially been confirmed. Um, the life course persistent group is disproportionately male. It makes up about 10% of the sample. Um, they're mostly boys. Um, the adolescent limited group um, is still more male than it is female, although it's more equally male and female. Um, and that adolescent limited group is not exactly an adolescent limited group. It's sort of an adolescent onset group. They're still engaging in higher levels of antisocial behavior in young adulthood than you might have predicted from the original theory. Um, they're not doing as poorly as the life course persistent group is, but they're not doing as well as the group that was just kind of going along all the way and engaging in low levels of, of antisocial behavior. All right, thank you.